So, um, so what I have prepared for you, according to the docket today, is I'm going to give a 90 minute presentation on 101 facts of truth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what a, what a great opportunity I got to chat and to keep on the speaker trial and a bunch of amateur astronomers. Um, by the end of the uh, yes, when the thunderbolts light up the sky, we got the sun. <laughs> by the end of my presentation, you're going to want to bookmark this website. This is the Flat Earth Society webpage. They take credit cards. You can see them back on the blog. There's chat rooms. Um, you can listen to celebrities speak, you know, and their theories about the flat earth. Kyrie Irving, I think those basketball player, was a big advocate of the flat earth society. Um, so, beginning with um, reason number one, I'm going to run all the way through 101 different reasons why the earth is flat. So, bear with me. I gotcha. <laughs> I gotcha. I'm kidding. Um, actually, I received an email from Linda a couple of weeks ago asking if I would come and give my presentation again. The last time I was here giving a, a talk was um, on the eve of your Astro Assembly back the first weekend of October. I gave a talk about a backyard amateur discovery, uh, astronomy discovery. And I see a lot of familiar faces here now that were here at that talk too, and I thought it was a little too taught too soon to give that talk over again. Um, um, she tells me that it was well received, and I appreciate that. I'm, I'm uh, grateful to be asked back here again. I know there's tons and tons of experiences and astronomy knowledge in this room. Um, a lot of you go back decades with this club and with your own enjoyment of astronomy. You know, it really is an honor to be here. And even though I don't make it to many meetings. I live in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Even though I don't make it to many meetings here, I, I do actively check in on what you're doing. I think you have one of the best uh, astronomy club websites around, you know, as far as the archives and, and what you're doing and the articles that people contribute. Um, it's good reading, you know. So even I'm, I'm, I'm an active, inactive member. <laughs> uh, I... I Letter that instead of talking about that backyard amateur astronomy uh, discovery so close to the last time that I did that here, that I would give two short talks tonight. One is on a, a, a something called pareidolia, and then the other half is on backyard recent backyard observation or images of the James Webb Space Telescope up in the sky from the backyard. Um, so, in preparation for the pareidolia, does, first of all, does anybody know what pareidolia is? No. 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 It was in the headline of a newspaper yesterday, and I recognized it because of your email. Really? Yes. Um, up until a year or so ago, I didn't know what pareidolia was either. <laughs> pareidolia is in the dictionary. It's a noun, and it's the tendency to perceive a specific, often meaningful image in a random or ambiguous visual pattern. So for years, we've been using pareidolia in amateur astronomy subconsciously. Every time we look at a nebula, you look at a nebula like the Pac-Man nebula. It looks like Pac-Man. The North American nebula is shaped like the, you know, the North American continent. Um, so pareidolia, the man in the moon is another one. This is literally, there's dozens and dozens of them up there. And I, I was going to make the first half of my presentation tonight on pareidolia. And for instance, um, I dug this out. This is an image that I took um, back in December. This is the Monkey Head Nebula. Everybody said the Monkey Head Nebula. But what I was going to do is take each of the images that I have in my collection, and some that are not my images, other images on the internet. And I was going to take them and put them in a better setting. <laughs> Put them in a better setting so that you could to help you visualize, you know, why people see them the way that they do and how the names get attached. So I started doing this and realized that it's very Photoshop intensive. <laughs> it's going to take me a long time to prepare this short pareidolia presentation. I'm, I'm still going to do it, but I couldn't do it in the amount of time that I had to get ready for tonight. 
So um, instead, what I did was I dug up some interesting astronomy projects that I worked on recently. Um, they're like short topics. And um, what I'm going to do is I've got a little rundown here. That's creepy looking. <laughs> I got a bunch of these that some of them are really funny, but you'll have to wait for that presentation. That's going to take me some time. Why can't I move ahead? Okay, so tonight's quick lineup. Paradolia is going to be postponed. I'll be back to do that down the road. I'm going to give a, a short presentation about super high resolution solar and lunar imaging. Um, did we really wave bye bye to the James Webb telescope when they said we did back on um, Christmas morning, 2021? Did anybody watch that, by the way? Did anybody get up on Christmas morning, 7 17 a.m., yeah. and watch the launch of the James Webb telescope from French Guiana, I think it was? And, and you know, the, the uh, cameras followed all the way up into space, and when it just the, the um, space telescope dislodged and it was leaving and it was heading out to its destination. Um, I see one hand go up. One, one. Uh, all right, a handful. That's good. Um, so I'm going to get into that. I'm going to put my mouse. A quick little segment on front with sunrises and sunsets. My very latest deep sky image that I took a week ago. Um, last Sunday's series transit of Galaxy M100. Did anybody observe that? Anybody watch that? It was really cool. I'm going to show you some pictures of that. And then at the end there, I'm going to have you keep in touch, meaning even though I'm not here every month, I want to keep in touch with you. And I don't know Michael Corvesi mentioned the Cosmic Coffee House. Um, the Cosmic Coffee House is a once a month Zoom meeting that I run. I put it on. I came up with the idea a year ago. And that the, what it is is a uh, chance during the month, on the 15th of every month, doesn't matter what day of the week it is, the 15th of every month, it's a chance for you to, to join in on a Zoom meeting, and we talk about whatever topics interest you, whatever's in the news, whatever project you're working on, um, upcoming things that are not to be missed, uh, anything at all. It's an informal group um, from four different astronomy clubs. I belong to the Astronomy Club in Rehoboth, Mass. I belong to the one up in Situate, Mass. Coincidentally, so Situate Mass, Situate Rhode Island, Behove, and then the Cape Cod Astronomy Club. So I'm a member of all four clubs. I do go to some of the meetings, but um, this is a chance on the 15th of every month to tie everybody together and to welcome people to chit chat on a Zoom meeting. Um, I'm going to send around a little sign up sheet for that afterwards. If you want it, if you want me to send you a reminder on the 15th every month, I will, and it will have the Zoom um, link and the password to get in. And I encourage you to, to join in. You can sit in and not say a word if you don't want to, or you can you can become active and, and talk about whatever you're working on, uh, whatever interests you at the time. Okay, sound good? Mm -hmm. and, one, and finally, too, I don't mind being up to, interrupted during my little talk. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and um, I'll answer your question on the fly. We're going to start with the solar and lunar imaging part, not real high resolution. We're taught from a young age not to look at the sun. Don't look at the sun. You're going to go blind. It hurts to look at the sun. It hurts your brain. It makes you see spots in front of your eyes. Don't look at the sun. Don't look at the sun. Don't look at the sun. And last summer, I looked at the sun a lot. But I did it with special telescopes. I did it with special cameras. And over the cast course of last summer, from about, I'd say, May to September, I took a collection of pictures. All these pictures of the sun were taken last summer alone. And uh, I'm gonna go over quickly how they were done. And I'm gonna tell you, show you some cool things about the sun. You've all been warned, right? You probably equip the telescope with the sun. You know, don't look at the sun. Don't even think about looking at it. There is a word. Uh, the, I'm a victim. I'm a uh, yeah, a victim of this, I guess. There's a word for if you look at the sun, it makes you sneeze. Does anybody else have that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a word for that. I forget what it's called, but um, I've noticed that since I was a kid. You know, I just kind of glance at the sun sideways, it makes me sneeze. If you have an old telescope at home, 
60 millimeter refractor was my first telescope. It came with a little filter that screwed into the bottom of the eyepiece here. It screwed, it screwed in there and, and it had a piece of real high density, thick um, glass in there, green glass. And you could observe the sun safely, right? No, because the, the sun's beam would be concentrated down the barrel of the telescope and it would get super hot right there. And there was a risk of this lens here cracking and causing blindness. So if you have one of those little filters at home or you see one, just take it and throw it in the woods as far as you can, because those things are bad news. Sometimes uh, eclipse glasses, you see those, those were popular 2017. Everybody had eclipse glasses. You could get them on Amazon and Amazon was selling faulty eclipse glasses that weren't safe. And that was another fiasco. But eclipse glasses with the proper mylar are safe for looking at the sun. Another way to look at the sun is to put a filter in front of your telescope. It blocks 99 and a certain percentage of light coming into your telescope in the first place so that you don't have that risk of it heating up at the opposite end. A lot of times these are glass or mylar um, filters to make it so that you can safely look at the sun. Um, there's a young girl looking at the sun there. And that kind of filter will allow you to see the sun in what they call white light. This is, this is one of my white light images of sunspots on the sun they can last June. Um, it shows sunspots. You can see these little um, darker areas on the sun. It shows limb darkening. It shows that the, the edges of the sun are a bit darker than the, the part that's closer to us and more directly aimed at us. It's got little whitish spots around the sunspot. You can see up there. The little whitish areas are called faculae which is Latin for little torches. Um, so there's a few things that you can see with a white light filter. This is a close-up of that particular major sunspot that was just on the previous image. Um, with just a white light filter, you can see granulations on the surface. You see how it's kind of grainy? Um, there's all these cells of, of plasma and whatnot bubbling up through the solar surface and causing the granulation that you can see the umbra, the dark area of sunspot, and the penumbra is the, the part that surrounds it. Um, interestingly, a lot of sunspots come or appear in groups, and there's polarity between the groups. So like there's a, a, a north and a south polarity. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Um, what filter did you use for that one? This is a, um, I think it's a thousand oaks glass filter. Yeah, on a, um, a five inch refractor, Takahashi refractor. Congratulations, spectacular. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's nice. Mark. <laughs> Go, Oops. Uh -oh. That concludes our discussion. <laughs> 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 let's see let's see okay this is the same image as the previous one and i use a black and white camera i'm going to explain why i use black and white in a minute but all i have to do is drag it into photoshop and i can colorize it any color i want so i can make it whatever nice shade of yellow it's a simple procedure uh, but black and white cameras are much more sensitive to, to detail and resolution than color cameras are which is why I use a little black and white camera. Um, Spaceweather.com is a pretty popular um, website that I check into every day. It lets me know what the aurora outlook is. You know, if there's an aurora, I'm going to know, I have a pretty good idea to get my butt out there and to inform friends and astronomy friends that they should be on the lookout. This happens to be this morning's image on um, spaceweather.com. It shows an update of the sunspots on the sun every day. You can see some of that faculae up there that I told you about, those whitish areas. But the sunspots are not very prevalent today. There's not much activity going on. But it is a website that I check every day. I have the little app on my phone, and I, with my morning coffee, this is one of the things I do is check the space well and see what's going on with the sunspots. And if they're busy, then I'll get out there with the solar scope. The next upgrade to white light observing of the sun is to use a hydrogen alpha telescope, solar telescope. This is only good for one purpose only, and it's for looking at the sun. I believe there's a few people in the club here that have a H alpha scope, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, 
I got this one maybe three or four years ago. I absolutely love it. It's amazing. Basically, this is what a H alpha um, telescope will allow you to see. The sun is red. It, it, it pinpoints a particular wavelength of light, uh, which is in the red end of the spectrum. But it allows you to see more details on there, such as um, these filaments. It lets you see uh, these prominences off the edge of the sun's limb. Um, the granulation is more pronounced. Um, and it's very dynamic. It changes from minute to minute, hour to hour. Um, it's it's pretty cool. It, it it changes before your eyes almost. Another website that I check every morning when I check the sunspot is I check to see what the sun is doing in H alpha. There's the National Solar Observatory has seven telescopes set up around the globe. And you click on the web link and it shows you what all seven of them are doing or have done in the past hour to a few minutes ago to a few hours ago. Um, this is today's image of the sun as, 11, as of 11.20 a.m. this morning. And this is the telescope set up in Chile. And it shows what's going on today on the sun with the same type of features that I just pointed out to you in the, on that, that red image of the sun. So again, I can, I can, you know, on the comfort of my couch and my cup of coffee in my hand, I can get an idea of what the sun's doing and see if I should run out there and, and take a look or get the camera out. Here's an image that I took last June. I tend to get into this more in the summertime. We have so much sunlight in the summertime. As you know, we only have five hours of real darkness every night. You know, it doesn't get dark until 10 at night and then it's light out at 3 a.m. Um, so I put more time into solar observing. Um, so this is a little webcam image of the sun on a particular day last June. This is the same image, just processed differently. It, it's processed in a way to make it more 3D, um, to give you an idea that some of these filaments here are coming at you. It is basically the same feature on the edge that you see as a prominence. The, per, the filament and the prominence are the same feature. It just depends on how, you, how you're looking at it, whether it's on the disc coming directly at you or on the, the limb, you know, we're seeing the profile. Um, but the sun, it, it just fascinates the heck out of me. There's some, some pretty active, pretty um, extreme activity of flares building up, you know, some bubbling up in the plasma under the surface there. There's a sunspot doing something crazy there and a prominence off to the side. Some more activity there. And what I do is I, um, I have the scope set up in my backyard observatory and I have a big screen computer in there. And the camera, I just run the little cable right to the computer and put it right on the screen and I can watch it literally like this, but it's in black and white. This color has been added falsely afterwards and you can just watch it and things do change. I wouldn't say like right before your eyes, but give it a few minutes and you can tell that the features are changed. I equate it to looking at the hands on a clock you know, you look at it, look at the clock, it says seven o'clock now, you look away, but when you look again, now it's 7.02. So it's moved, you didn't see it moving, but it has moved, you do notice differences. And it's pretty cool, cool in that regard. Um, um, and expanding on that, I'll show you some videos that I took of the sun over time so that you can see these features like an hour and a half worth of time in just a little 10 second video. I have two of those that I'll share with you shortly. More activity here. Lots of lots of turbulence going on between the sunspots. You know, as I said earlier, you got the north end, the south end, and then there's lots of turmoil going on in between there. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. And there's a filament there. This is kind of this is kind of like up off the surface. Um, headed more towards us, like headed in our direction off this 2D um, image that you see here. Now, last, I forget the date, the date will come up in a second, but I have the telescopes, solar scope set up in the morning, 9.30 is when the sun clears my trees. I try to get out there early uh, before the sun warms up the roof of my house. I'm looking over the roof of my house, 
there have been times when I've been tempted to get out there with a hose and cool off the roof of my house <laughs> before the neighbors wake up. <laughs> I don't want them to catch me doing it. Yes, sir. I see a monkey face again. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, you're looking at you, Linda. <laughs> it looks like he's on his haunches, on his yeah, haunches, yeah. ready to pounce. So what happened with this was I set up the scope in the morning, and what I'll do is I'll look at it, I'll get a mental picture of what I see in there, and then I'll I'll go do some chores. You know, in this particular day, I cut the grass. You know, and I left the scope so I went out of the dome, and it, it continued to track the sun. And I'd look again, and I notice all the changes that had happened since the hour earlier when I had been looking. And this particular day, um, I was about to lose the sun. I, I can only see it from about nine in the morning to two thirty in the afternoon, and it was almost at that two thirty in the afternoon point to where the, the sun goes behind my tree line again. And I took a final look, and out of nowhere, this monstrous flare that was on the on the edge of the sun. And my jaw dropped. I said, oh my God. So I scrambled to start taking images of it, you know, taking video so that I could make this, this picture that you see here. And it was very short lived. Um, it, it, it lasted maybe less than an hour and it actually lifted off the sun. Um, I didn't get that part of the, the happening, but I did know I, I was able to determine that it did lift off the sun a short time after. And this, the height of this thing made me wonder. How big is that thing? You know, when you see the, the sun up against the, the disk of well, the Earth, rather, up against the disk of the sun, the, the Earth is just a little tiny dot. So on the internet, I found this cool little template. It's put out by a French gentleman who, um, this, this is all in, written in France. But what it is is a template. And what you do is you take, see this, this ring right here with the little graduations on it? You take that and you stretch it, re rescale it, resize it so that it fits the disc of your sun. And once you've, you've you know, pulled on the corners of it and made it fit over the disc of your sun properly, then it gives you these heights, you know, 50,000 kilometers, 100,000 kilometers, and so on. You know, if you can measure the height of um, the different prominences that you see. And then down here, you see they give the comparative size of Jupiter. And then that little dot there is, is the comparative size of Earth. So if I take this template and I, I make it sort of transparent in Photoshop and I put it over the image that I took, you see that? You see my picture in the background and that template over the front of it? And made the, made the, um, the circle conform with the arc of the, the sun there. You can see that that, that prominence there was more than 200,000 kilometers or 132,000 miles high, um, which is just amazing. Um, additionally, I can rotate around that little disk and I can, I can put that, that little Jupiter and, and Earth comparison thing there and I can drag it into place. And when I do, I'm able to properly put the Earth to scale, you know, next to the size of that prominence there. And now I have the details of when I took it. It was 2.02 p.m. on June 10th of 2022. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like this, this whole project kind of fell into my lap, you know. I was ready to close down for the day, and then this thing erupted, and then I went to town with it and came up with this little um, composite here. So it worked out perfectly. Here's another one from August 3rd. The per this prominence went up one side, across, and was pulled down to the sun a, a ways later. And again, I was able to use that scale and, and you know, reasonably put the size of the Earth there next to it. Now, this is my little science lesson for today. This is the sunspot that I showed you earlier that was on that white line image of the sun. I mentioned that it has most sunspot are in pairs or groups of pairs with a north polar end and a south polar end. Um, so there's tugging between the two. So what I did, I went on Amazon.com, Amazon Prime, free shipping, 
and I ordered one of these bar magnets. Some of you may remember these from, you know, grade school fun with magnets project, a horseshoe magnet, paper clips. This is a bar magnet. It's got a north polar end and a south polar end, and they want to pull at each other. I took that magnet. I got a little cardboard box, shallow cardboard box, got some yellow construction paper. My mother was a career art teacher for elementary school, so there's lots of construction paper around the house. I cut out the yellow construction paper and put it in the bottom of the box, and I put the magnet underneath. You can see the magnet underneath the box there. At the same time that I bought the magnet on Amazon, I bought a little shaker of iron filings. Um, if you take a nail and you run it over a file, all the little bits that fall would be iron filings. It's got on the top there that flips up, it's like a pepper shaker. It's got little holes in the top of it. So with the magnet underneath, I took the iron filings and I started shaking them onto the box. And then I got this cool design. Um, and now I'm going to try to zoom in on that. See that? Yeah. Wow. See the pulling between the north and the south pole, the magnet underneath? And it is it it sets up this cool kind of a matrix or this exchange of magnetic material. Um, and the plasma, plasma is strange stuff, and I don't know how it ends up being magnetic, but it does. It, it made this really neat design. So continuing along, this is that same sunspot that we were looking at in hydrogen alpha light, that one with the north and the south pole. And you can see the similar type of interaction between the, the south and the north pole of the sunspot here. To give you a better idea, I made this little animated GIF here. Same sunspot group, white light, hydrogen alpha light, back and forth, back and forth. It's just a matter of seeing it in two different wavelengths. And that hydrogen alpha light really lets the, like the magnetism pop into view. See that? Any questions about this at this point? imaging the sun. I got a lot more projects in my head. They're all written on scrap on post-it notes and are all over my little office in the basement. Go do this, try that, you know. Um, all these ideas for image, different images of the sun that I want to try. Um, so pretty soon when the better weather gets here, I'm going to switch from deep sky observing mode to sun mode. Yeah. Uh, when you take an image, like with that Im image of the prominence, you take two images, one of the prominence and one of the surface, and merging them, or are you doing it as one thing? Yeah, this question is to get the prominence coming off the sun's disk. There's two very wide variations in brightness. The, the solar disk is super bright. The prominence is not nearly as bright. So he asked the question if I'm taking two different images, and, and the answer is yes. But one, I expose for the, just the prominence. When I do that, it shows the prominence beautifully, but the sun is just white. It's just completely overblown, overexposed, no detail on the sun at all. And then conversely, I'll back off on the prominence. The prominence will like fade into a black background, and then the solar features will really pop out. So yes, I take both, and then afterwards, um, match them together, you know, and, and make a picture that shows both of them in reasonable exposure. Same setup. For the moon. This is a moon coming over the trees last February in my backyard. You've all seen what looked like similar to this a couple of nights ago, first quarter. <laughs> um, that black and white little webcam that I use is a bottom uh, view of the bottom southern highlands region of the moon. This is actually after full moon. So this is a, a waning gibbous, I guess it would be. Um, I can see the monolith. Yeah. <laughs> can you see the flag? Everyone asks if they can see the flag. I see the monolith in Cleveland. Yeah. Oh, down here? Yeah. Yeah. No, up, up, up. No, we're going to get closer. We'll get closer with this one. And there it is. Right there? No, in Clavius. Where about it? The big one. Oh, up here? Left. Yeah, that's Clavius. Yep. Where's the monolith? 
It's in there somewhere, <laughs> according to. I have a real. Two thousand and one. I have a real, real extreme close-up of Clavius coming up, so maybe you can point it out in that. <laughs> so anyway, this is with a C eleven telescope. Again, black and white camera, so I get that real high detail. Um, what I do is I take a video. Uh, at like 60 frames per second really quick 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 video and i run it for a minute or two um so if you if you run in 60 frames per second for a minute that's 60 frames for 60 seconds so 3600 images you get 36 individual frames this software that will sift through those and pick the best ones out the sharpest ones uh, so i discard all the others I align, I stack and align the, the sharpest ones, and then things really start to become much crisper and really pop into view. Um, there's a closer view. Uh, Ptolemaeus, Arzakel, and Alphonsus, I believe, are the, the names of these. This is on the um, way over on the right hand side of the moon. I don't know if that would be the eastern side of the moon. What, what side is the right side of the eastern limb? Um, a close up of this particular crater is one that's similar. It's way over on the eastern side of the moon. And then you're all familiar with the straight wall. Have you seen the straight wall before? This is a little bit unusual in that most people, when they see the straight wall, it's black. And what the straight wall is, it's a long fault. I think it's about 110 miles long right here. Starts here and goes, I think, for 110 miles. And I think it's just a difference in the height of the terrain, right? It's almost like part of the surface settled or a part of it got pushed up or something and at first quarter when the sun is over here on the right hand side the sun signs this way and first quarter is when it's convenient for us all because it's before bedtime this appears black it's a it's a black streak because it's in shadow but if you wait two weeks like i did i was out during the wee hours of the morning during last quarter when the sun is on that opposite wall and now the sun is shining directly on the the pot that rises above the surface there so it illuminates it and makes it white instead of black mm -hmm. my goal doing this was to get both images you know i still have to collect the easier one i haven't this this is from last september mm -hmm. i haven't been out there yet to get the other side of it but i will i'll have the two and you can see the, the effect of both um some people speaking of pareidolia does anyone know what what item can be found here with the straight wall has anyone, anyone ever heard of the static sword? The sword. See the long sword here? The, the, the long blade coming down and then the little, the little handle right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you're getting ready to fence and yeah. joust or whatever they call it. It'll be monkey man too. Stage four parable. This is looking straight down on Copernicus. Oh, wow. Um, I can even zoom in on that a little more for you. It should be able to handle the zooming. Yeah, Copernicus is about 50 miles across. And I've heard that if you were standing in the center of Copernicus, if you were on the moon standing on the center there, that the moon, the curvature of the moon is so much greater than that of the Earth because it's smaller, is that if you were standing on the edge, you wouldn't see the walls. I don't know if that's true or not because the, because the, the horizon would be already the walls would be already below your horizon all the way around whether that's true or not i don't know but i, I have heard that before oh. is that extreme close-up of clarity that i was telling you about um Monolith, which is going to point out the monastery. <laughs> it's right there. The one in the oh, the oh, right in the middle there. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, I see it. The cool thing here is the way that the, the little cradlets on the bottom get successively bigger as they make this little yeah. U shape. See that? They get they get yeah. bigger as you go. Just for fun, I put this image through a. Uh, Space capsule portal. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
So it's like you're sitting like right here, right here, looking out the window as it goes by you. I have a lot of free time. <laughs> Another comparison, right? Just for comparison, little roadie. We have more potholes, though. <laughs> <laughs> This is the little camera I use, a little ZWO ASI 178MM. There's, there's several different ones available. Um, I think it costs about $300 new. Comes with all these little cables and instructions and a little eyepiece nose you can slip it into your telescope. You take your eyepiece out, you slip this in, and then you plug it into your computer and you use the software that comes with it and you're off to the races. They come up for sale on Astro Hot and Cloudy Night, Cloudy Nights quite a bit. Here's one that was selling for two hundred and forty dollars. Um, I checked today. There's there's more on there if you were looking to get one used. It's pretty reasonable. And the reason I use black and white over color cameras is because of these little colored lenses that they put over the pixels. Uh, what they do to make a color imager is they take two green filters one red and one blue filter and they put them over each pixel and what that does is it yes it gives you a color image but it limits the amount of light that's getting to your sensor um, for instance if you got a pixel that's, that's this particular width it only lets through the red light so you're losing two-thirds of the, of the resolution right there same thing with the green you know, you're only getting a very thin wavelength of light in green and then blue, it's the same thing. Um, I do have a color version of that camera too, and for the heck of it, I tried it, and I, two minutes later, I was yanking it out and putting the black and white one back in because I was so much more happy with the black and white imager over the color one. Um, the color one is better for planets, though, I will say that. One of the most important things to look for, not just a clear night for imaging the moon, but the sky has to be steady. Uh, this is a, a jet stream forecast website that I go to. It's called Chile Scope, Chile, C-H-I-L-E-S-C-O-P-E. -E. And what it does is it shows you a forecast of where the jet stream is going to be. This is the jet stream for seven o'clock, a couple, couple hours ago, um, or over us. And it shows, you know, we're down here in Rhode Island, New England, southern New England, and wherever it's yellow, that's where the jet stream is, and that means horrendous seeing conditions. However, we're right on the edge of this purple-blue coloration, which is over here on the, the chart on the bottom, and purpley blue is good. So quickly things can shift over as, as things move. You can click on each hour and kind of move along and see what it's going to be like for the next few hours or even for the next day. And it gives you an idea when you can get those really clear nights for observing either the sun or the moon, either one. Uh, seeing conditions are very important. And then finally, I also use this one. This one's called Medio Blue for my particular site. And what this does is for each day, this is Saturday, this is today, every hour. Right now we're at about 20 to 21, 8 to 9 o'clock. And it shows you the amount of cloud cover. We're basically 100% on the cloud. Well, it's, it said we would be, but it looks pretty clear out there now. I was out there a minute ago when you can see the moon. So the forecast was not quite very good on this, but it also gives the seeing conditions. You want to see green boxes here, green over here. Um, and you know that you're going to have pretty pretty good seeing. It shows the arc seconds resolution that they're predicting. You know, the smaller the number, the better. Um, so that's another tool that I use. It's it's not always in the same on the same page as the other one that I just showed you, the other jet stream website. But it gives me an idea anyway of how to look for the good nights. And finally, in wrapping up this sun moon presentation. I find it amazing, and I've always found it amazing, how the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, and the sun is also 400 times farther away than the moon, so they appear to be the same size from our perspective in the sky. It's amazing, right? They're both about half a degree wide, and at least once a month, they're exactly the same size. You know, as the moon goes from apogee to perigee, there's a point during the month that it's exactly down to the 
micro arc the same size as the sun. That's always that's always amazed me. I put my two images in my hands there. <laughs> but if you think about eclipses, you know, the sun and the moon are the same size. Um, there's mention of that annular eclipse coming up in October where the sun, the moon is going to be almost at apogee or close to apogee. That's why it's not going to completely cover the sun. If you take that trip out to New Mexico, the moon is going to be smaller than the disk of the sun, and you're still going to see the ring of fire or the ring of sun around the moon. Um, but for the most part, they're pretty comparable in, uh, in size. These are, these, this is a, a composition I made of two different eclipses that I took photos of. The one that goes upwards like that was the solar eclipse of 2017. I went out to Idaho and took pictures of that. And then the one that slants down with was a total lunar eclipse of January of 2019. And I just kind of spooled around and kind of made them look like a lunar and solar eclipse. And it, it clearly shows that they're about the same size. That concludes the first segment. That was one of the lengthy segments. Any, any, sec, any questions on that part so far? Yes, sir. Have you ever considered putting in a chronograph on your telescope to be able to block out the image of the sun and then re-image in your hydrogen alpha or something to get much, much higher um, uh, sensitivity to the thing? I haven't thought about that. I'm still relatively new at this sun stuff, believe it or not. I've been an astrophotographer for 40 years, but, but this imaging of the sun stuff and trying to get the best that I can, I'm still only like two years into it. It, it sounds like a neat project. I'll contact you. Okay, yeah, please do. Okay. Please do. Another post it note. <laughs> yeah, another post it note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just leave it on my car out there. <laughs> so, where, where is the James Webb telescope? We're switching gears here. For those of you that did get up on Christmas morning, 2021, this is a, almost like a screenshot of what was shown on television. And the commentator, I remember his words saying, there goes the James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to be going for a million, I mean, uh, a month until it gets to its destination, a million miles away at the L2 point. Um, humanity waves goodbye to the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're all, you know, they're standing around, they're clapping and everything, and this thing's getting smaller and smaller. But being the pesky little amateur astronomer that I am, I said, wait a minute, we're not done seeing it yet. There's a website called The Sky Live. And you can go on there and you can go up here to the probe section and you can select James Webb Space Telescope. And when you click on it, right for that instant, it gives you the coordinates of where the James Webb Space Telescope is in the sky for that moment. It doesn't move very much. Every time you refresh the website, the coordinates change slightly. Um, but for the most part, it'll tell you where it is in the sky. So I took these coordinates in the constellation Cancer, uh, well placed right now. As it turns out, the James Webb is almost always well placed for us because it's opposite the sun with the earth in the middle. So it's, it's always an opposition if you think about it. Every time the sun is setting in the west, the James Webb Space Telescope is coming up in the east, more or less, you know, because it's opposite the, the earth with the earth in the middle. So just about any night of the year, you can go out and find the James Webb Space Telescope. So I get out there, I took a three minute exposure. Oh, first before. Before <laughs> this, is, this is what they call a camera. <laughs> no, no, what I wanted to say was um, the reason that we can catch a glimpse of the web telescope so far away is because it has these reflective, reflective panels here protect it both from the heat and light from the sun. So the sun would be down at the floor and reflections off of these, uh, there's some kind of fancy mylar material, reflect the, earth, the sunlight back to us, the earth. So we can actually catch a glint of this coming back to us from the James Webb Space Telescope up in space. So here is my three minute exposure, February 24th. I got out there, I punched in those coordinates. I took the three minute exposure. And right there, I had a planetarium program open at the same time. They had these same stars on the on an adjacent computer. And that one didn't belong. It wasn't on the planetarium program as, as being a, a star that belonged there. Um, and as I watched it, as I watched these three-minute exposures continue to come up on the computer, it would move just a little tiny bit. 
just a wee bit. I put down the comparable um, magnitudes there, 13.6 to 14.7. So it's somewhere around 13 and a half to 14 and a half magnitude, which is similar to uh, Pluto's magnitude. So if you're able to see Pluto with a telescope, you could even see this with your naked eye, with a naked eye attached to a telescope. Um, <laughs> right? No camera, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, you, you can see it visually if you wanted to. It's within reasonable grasp of amateur equipment. So the next thing that I did was run these exposures for an hour. Oh. I ran the camera from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. And you can see here that it left a streak. I told you that it was moving a little bit between each three minute exposure. So over the course of an hour, it moved, it moved from the bottom up, it was going that way. And uh, it's headed towards a galaxy up there, see that little faint galaxy? It was headed up in that direction. I zoomed in on it a little bit. And I saw a little bit of a curve. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see that from me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it's hooking a little bit? It's not quite a straight line. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that intrigued me. There's even a couple more little pink galaxies right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. The longer you expose, the deeper you look. This is with a C11 again, and this is with a this is with a CCD camera. This isn't a webcam at this point. This is a S big CCD camera. Um, but I thought that was interesting, and it intrigued me. So what I did was I got on the internet, good old internet, and I oh, found wow. this. This is the path in the sky that the James Webb makes over the course of the year. It's got a year's worth of dates there, and it kind of like makes this path, but it's more or less in opposition all the time. It's always like opposite the sun in the sky. And for the particular date that I took that picture, um, February 24th, that red arrow is pointing to February 24th right here. And you can see that it's starting to make that bend there. It's at a point in this orbit in the sky that it's it, that it's making a hairpin turn and it's starting to loop back the other way. So I believe, I think that's what I caught there um, in that short one hour exposure, just enough to show that it was going in that direction. Um, so this intrigued me enough that I got on the James Webb Space Telescope Facebook page and I posted everything that I just told you. I said this, that this is where I get the coordinates. I said, there's my image. There's my time exposure with the streak and there's the close up and there's the, the path that I took. And I, I told people in a paragraph what I just told you all. And I said, do you think this is due to the curvature of its route around the sky? I said, I'd be interested in hearing your theory. Thank you and be nice, I said, <laughs> because they can be cool on the internet. People were nice. Um, 400 people liked this post. I got 40, well, here at the time here, it was 39 comments, people chiming in with their, what they thought it was and whatnot. And two interesting facts came back from asking the public at large what they thought about this. One is somebody said, it's this the analemma. You know, it's the particular analemma that the James Webb Space Telescope makes in the sky over the course of the year. And if you're familiar with an analemma, this is the path that the sun makes in the sky over the course of the year uh, for a particular location. And to show you that a little more clearly, um, these are multiple pictures of the sun um, showing the figure eight that it makes. I, I think this is on the meridian, like the, the north-south meridian over the course of a year. But when you take, you know, pictures over time, you get this this shape. And I think that weird squiggly that I got is because the, the space telescope is a heck of a lot closer. And I think um, because the Earth is rotating and we're, we're, you know, we're moving around the sun, I think it makes a more complicated analemma than what we would see with the sun. So that was helpful information that someone provided. And then the other thing, like before I go to that, the other thing someone said is, he says, he takes images of the James Webb Space Telescope, and he says, you never know what the brightness is gonna be. That SkyLive website doesn't give you the magnitude. You have no idea what it's gonna be because it depends on which way it's oriented at the time. What, what it's pointing at, in other words, you know, it dictates how those reflective shields are gonna send back sunlight. 
you know, so if it changes its target, it might be dimmer some nights than it is at other times. So I went out a week later, and this time, three minute exposure, same setup. It was a new full, a near full moon, was only 11 degrees away. You can't see it there, but just a week later, it was already down to like almost 17th magnitude. And it was just at 14th magnitude a week earlier. Um, it doesn't have to do with the moonlight because I can see 16th and 17th magnitude stars there, but it was almost invisible right there. Almost invisible because it wasn't tilted properly for us to see it brightly. Again, I took the one hour exposure, actually two hours. I went two hours this time because I wanted to see if I could catch that curvature again. And I figured if I did it for a longer time, the curve might show up better. And it does. The only thing is I'm working with a full moon and I'm also working with a really dim time for looking. But if I zoom in on it, you can see there it is. Yeah. You can see the two hours. You might be able to see a little, little almost like dots that go along. And those are the three minute exposures, you know, all stacked together. But it, but it certainly shows the curve. So it's continuing along that, that graph that I showed you earlier. Um, it was pretty interesting to see. You know, it's not something I'd been expecting, um, but it was neat to follow through and to catch more than a curve. We're shifting gears again. Bunch of short topics, that's all I have left. Um, sunrises. Stonehenge is built so that the sun signs through parts of it during particular celestial events. In this case, is a picture of the sun appearing through this particular opening um, during the winter solstice. And it's believed that that's how they mark different paths. So I kept track of the sun's path across the sky. It started with Stonehenge. Question. Then, yep. Um, that was built how many thousand years ago? I don't know. 4,000. So 4,000? Yes. Four, yeah, 4,000. So in that time frame, that 4,000 years, um, sunrise and sunset don't occur at the same time. Right. There's been some procession and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So why do you get the image that you get? Well, they move the stone. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I sped off that slide quickly. It's because I don't know. Oh, okay. ah, so I don't know. Maybe it was a different set of stones 4,000 years ago. But the, I guess the point is I'm trying to make the use they don't, you know, the openings, the slots and whatnot. So modern day, this is Manhattan Henge on, on May 30th and July 11th every year on the east west streets. And there's like four or five different streets that I found on the Internet that they're not necessarily next to each other, but they're but they're east west <laughs> traveling. Um, people gather to watch the sunset right, right at the you know, the end of the alley there. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty cool. You know, it's a way that people yeah. kind of following the same logic that the Stonehenge people built, you know, 4,000 years earlier. <laughs> Finally, on a special day for me personally, every year on March 11th, from my front window, looking out the living room, the sun shines on my neighbor's window across the top. <laughs> How would you know that? Every year. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> At first, the first time I saw this two years ago, I thought the neighbor's house was on fire. Oh. I literally looked over, and this is what I, I was blinded by the light. And uh, the sun is way down the street. So this street, this street runs east-west, and the, the sun is way down on the west, almost near setting, um, shining up this way and reflecting off their window and into my face. There's another. There's another occurrence similar to Manhattan Hens, and that's at MIT. The, um, the hallway? The long hallway. Mm -hmm. And there's, yeah, two days every year that that occurs as well. Steve was saying that there's a hallway at MIT where the sun shines, I guess, through a window or a door right down the hallway for certain days. So it's, the main, it's the main yeah. hall. It's the main it's hall in, in uh, the building that has the dome on it. Oh, okay. It, the building that has the dome on it. It's in that building. It's in that building. Oh, cool. Very interesting. Any questions on this before I move on? These are just like recent topics that I'm just sharing with you. This is my most recent deep sky image. 
uh, took this over three nights, March 16 to 19. It's about nine hours of exposure. This is um, the CCD camera again with LRGB filters. Uh, your 11 inch? Yeah, 11 inch. Um, if you're not familiar with this, um, this galaxy, this giant spiral galaxy is cannibalizing another galaxy known as NGC 5195. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the mess up here. That's all in disarray because it passed too close to the Whirlpool galaxy. And it's literally pulling material off this galaxy and adding to its own spiral arms. The blue means young stars, relatively young. There's a lot of material in there, a lot of hydrogen, a lot of dust, new stars being made. And the orange, orange and yellow color is old material, old stars, you know, they're, they're towards the end of their life. Um, it, it's a pretty cool little project, but that's the most the most recent deep sky image a couple weeks ago. Now, how many of you, when you were in school, Pluto was a planet? <laughs> yeah. All of it, right? How many of you were as mad as I was on August 24, 2006, when it got kicked out of the solar system? So we have eight planets now, although there's a legendary missing planet nine uh, to be determined. But now, but Pluto was kicked down to dwarf planet status. So Pluto was kicked down, and the largest asteroid known as Ceres was kicked up. It's the largest asteroid, smallest planet. They're now in the same group known as dwarf planets. And we found a few more way out there in the, in the beyond Pluto range. Um, the reason I bring this up is because last Sunday, Sunday night, there was an astronomical event, and this is an image of what was going to happen Sunday night from 8 p.m. through 2 a.m. The asteroid series was going to start out on a spiral arm, you know, and for each couple of hours, it was going to move that way. Um, there are some fellas in the club that I belong to in situ at Mass, South Shore Astronomical Society. They were setting up to observe this visually. They had a 20 inch telescope aimed at this, and we're going to observe it visually with a 20 inch scope. They easily saw Ceres. Ceres was at magnitude 6.9, I think, relatively bright. Easily saw the asteroid, but all they saw was the core of the galaxy. You know, under the light polluted skies that we live in, they could not see the spiral arms at all. So they saw the glow of the, the core, the center part of the galaxy. And then they saw the asteroid out here. And they asked me if I wanted to join them. I said, no, thanks. I got another idea. So I set up the CCD camera on the 11 inch. And I took, oh. took I started at nine o'clock. I had to wait till nine o'clock. I couldn't start at eight. I had to wait till nine for this to clear to my trees again. And I took successive three minute, three minute images for the next five hours. So I took a full five hours of three minute images. That's 20 images per hour for five hours, 100 total images. This composite here that you see is only six of those images. One exactly at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, and two o'clock. So I just took those six. And I stacked them up and came up with this, this image here that shows the progression of series across the, um, the spiral arms of M100. And then to top it off, after doing this, I took all 100 images, you know, the full, the full run of pictures taken from 9 p.m. to 2 p.m. And I aligned those and stacked them up. So what came out with that was this one. Wow. This shows the streak that series left. There's no interruptions in between. It's just one picture after another, after another. After. But over time, you see at 9 o'clock, starts at the left, ends at 2 o'clock when I shut things down. But having those 100 images at three minutes each came out to a five-hour exposure of the galaxy in the background. Yeah. You know, and um, when I stack all 100 of those, all these other galaxies pop into view. You can see quite a few of them here. All those little faint fuzzies are, are more galaxies. Um, Steve, a comment? Yes, yeah. I have one thing to say. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I don't know, you may have seen this picture before, maybe not. This is my little backyard observatory. I built it 26 years ago. It's required a lot of maintenance and all the flowers don't grow themselves. <laughs> um, a lot of maintenance, it's a labor of love. It's my happy place in the world. The door, yeah, every little, every little stinking little detail is carefully uh, adhered to. I go for long walks every day and I think about these things. <laughs> yeah, I used to have glow in the dark stars on the door. I, I've tried everything in there, but anyway, from the observatory, this this different scopes that I swap in and out of there. There's an urban and um, gear mounted, you know, a mount that can handle like 110 pounds of telescope if I wanted to. But there's underground cables, and the cables went underground about 75 feet or so to my little basement office. So these two computers that you see here basically run the camera and the telescope and the dome. Um, this, this computer on the left operates the mount, so I can go left, right, up, down. Um, and then the image that's coming up from the CCD camera comes on this computer here. And then this is just a laptop. I have another big computer here that I can I can do a little research while while things are collecting and, and piling up on that computer. Um, so I call it my little mission control. <laughs> you know, I, I got I can put my PJs on and got a cup of cocoa and, and that's why it's easy for me to, to put five hours into taking a picture. It's because I can just hang out in the house, you know, and just check on this from time to time. Um, it's it's lazy astronomy at its best. You <laughs> Yeah. Yes. What's that? Are you retired? I am. <laughs> I am. I was. Uh, I worked as a pharmacist for 32 years at Walgreens, and um, I am retired now. I have no alarm clock. I tell people I set my alarm clock twice a year to go to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, you know, I, I I'm free to stay out all night. Um, so, in summary, I just want to bring up this cosmic coffee house one more time, and I'm going to pass around a little sign up sheet and all you're going to do is write your name and email address on it if you want me to send you an invite every month and what we do during this zoom meeting every month is we talk about topics like this you know these are the kind of topics that as i do them i put them on the um, the little discussion group that we have on the 15th of every month and um you're free to join in with anything that you might be working on you know or you can sit and just you know chill out if you want to um any topic goes it's free form everybody's friendly it lasts about an hour an hour and a half we have a great time and um i hope that you'll join this there's about 15 regulars i would say there's about 15 regulars that, that come in every month but i'm trying to get more this is my name and address my where i live and if if you're on Facebook or Instagram, I have literally dozens and dozens or even a hundred images posted on these two websites um, that you can check out, including all the ones you saw tonight are all on there. Um, I've been taking pictures, like I say, for 20 years. So there's, there's lots of images on there that, that you can just check out. And I post the most current projects on there too. All right. Anyway, sorry about that. Thank you, folks. For <laughs>